Now, first of all, let me say I, I think that the comparison with the Holocaust uh, between the Gaza genocide and the Holocaust is absolutely legitimate. It's not only legitimate, it's actually necessary, right? And it's very important that we resist the pressure that we are getting from the Israel lobbies in various countries that have infiltrated lawmaking processes and policing, for instance, in, in Germany, very effectively, and are appropriating the repression apparatus of the state. And the pressure goes into forbidding us to make that comparison. Um, and we have to reject that. I think it's a very important form of um, resistance, uh, actually, that we don't go along with that and reject it out of hand. Um, the Gaza genocide is precisely that. It's a genocide. The Holocaust was a genocide. They're categorically comparable. They were not the same, but that's not the question. They're comparable. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Gaza is a death camp. It's a live-streamed Holocaust being carried out by an Israeli society, joyously convulsing in open displays of genocidal fascism. And the ruling class in the U.S. is guaranteeing this horror continues, no matter the cost. How does a society become so hateful and fascist that its citizens revel in the mass slaughter of babies, block food aid to starve them, and openly celebrate torturing and butchering them? What's with the US-led West's ride or die attitude when it comes to Israel's barbarism? And how might this Gaza method be applied elsewhere? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Tariq Cyril Amar, a historian from Germany who's currently an associate professor of history at Koch University in Istanbul. Hi, Rania, very nice to be back. Well, it's good to have you back, though, of course, the subject matter is worse than the last time we spoke. I mean, the last time I had you on the show, it was, I think, about maybe a little over a month into this genocide in Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, and things have only gotten worse. And it's just shockingly disgusting what we're witnessing on a number of levels. So a good place to start is, I think, you know, you have studied the Holocaust before, which was carried out by genocidal fascists. And today we're witnessing a kind of live stream genocide. I, I would even call it a live stream Holocaust in its own way at the hands of this, you know, Israeli society that's convulsing in supremacy and just, you know, publicly celebrating their depravity against Palestinians. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of egomaniacal enjoyment of genocide. And before I have you comment on that, I actually want to play a video that gives, you know, I think a good impression of what I'm talking about here. I mean, what, one of the things that we've seen over the last month is Israelis going to these border crossings uh, with Gaza and actually setting up protests to try to create obstacles to aid going in. And of course, the Israeli government isn't stopping them because they don't want aid to go in. And this is like, I think, one of the more revolting images where this is Israelis bringing their kids and having like almost like a carnival with a bouncy house outside of it. Somebody put together this video, so I'm gonna play it real quick. Um, so it's like a children's event. Come bring your families. Come have fun. Let's block aid from entering. Let's basically starve, like stop feeding Hamas. Let's starve people in Gaza. And this is one of so many. I mean, I could sit here and do, you know, an hour's worth of just playing mm. videos of Israelis behaving like this. You know, there's this other video I was considering playing, but it just makes me too angry. So I can't where Israeli soldiers are basically showing off all the food they have mm. to eat um, as Palestinians particularly children are, are, are experiencing and dying of famine right now. Um, and it's just, you know, I guess my question for you, since you've studied the, the outcome of when a society goes, goes just completely genocidally fascist, 
how does this happen? How did we get to a point or how does a society get to a point where they can do something like this, where it really is reminiscent of, you know, two things come to mind. One is the Nazi Holocaust. Another is, I don't know if you are familiar with the Jim Crow South in the US, but families used to get together, Mm -hmm. white families in the Jim Crow South and have what was called uh, lynching picnics where they would bring their families and it would be right next to where there was a lynching. So there would be like the dead body of like a black person hanging from a tree and they would literally have a barbecue. Mm -hmm. How does this happen? You know, um, of course, a a lot of very smart people have, have, have thought about this and and written about this for, for decades by now. Right. So I, 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 don't have anything particular original to contribute, but I do think that, um, first of all, let me say, I I think that the comparison with the Holocaust uh, between the Gaza genocide and the Holocaust is absolutely legitimate. It's not only legitimate, it's actually necessary, right? And it's very important that we resist the pressure that we are getting from the Israel lobbies in various countries that have infiltrated lawmaking processes and policing, for instance, in, in Germany, very effectively, and are appropriating the repression apparatus of the state. And the pressure goes into forbidding us to make that comparison. Um, and we have to reject that. I think it's a very important form of um, resistance, uh, actually, that we don't go along with that and reject it out of hand. Um, The Gaza genocide is precisely that. It's a genocide. The Holocaust was a genocide. They're categorically comparable. They were not the same, but that's not the question. They're comparable. The second thing, uh, closer to what you asked me, um, I, you know, I think the, everybody says this, but it needs to be said, but one of the key things to get a large number of people to behave like this, right, with this degree of a joyful brutality, right? Not only committing terrible crimes against their fellow human beings, and not just crimes that are, in quotation marks, just, that are about gain or making a profit, right? Humans do this all the time. But crimes that clearly are sadistic, highly sadistic, right? The the profit of the crime is to gain the suffering of the victim, right? And as many as you can. And how do you get a lot of people to do this? One thing is, of course, that you have to um, you have to neutralize compassion. Uh, I think most people do have compassion. It's a natural feature, right? The, the only types who really don't have compassion are psychopaths. That's what we call a psychopath, right? Um, most people have compassion, so you need to switch that off. You need to make them into sociopaths. And one way you can do this is you dehumanize the object of the attack, right? Um, they have to be turned into the mental, the psychological equivalent in the mind of the perpetrator, obviously not in reality, of, say, vermin. And we've seen this again and again and again. And in fact, we've seen caricatures, even in the context of this specific attack on Gaza, this Gaza genocide, that have done precisely that, that have depicted Palestinians as vermin-like, with caricatured vermin-like features. It's not that prominent in this case, but it's definitely there and it's very telling. Um, the other thing is, and this has been described by um, sociologists who have worked on the Holocaust decades ago, you can also think of this as you need to get people to exclude a whole group from what we could call the realm of social obligation or the realm of moral obligation, right? This whole group of people, you don't owe them normality. You don't owe them reciprocity. You don't owe them decency. It's not only that you are in conflict with them. Conflict is a different matter. You don't owe them the least respect. You can do anything to them. It's okay. They are not part of your in-group and only your in-group counts. And I think um, Israel is a terrible form of in-group by now, a horrific in-group. you have said rightly that how do you get so many people to do this? I think this is a point that must be underlined. We now see that Israeli society has, I think, millions of genocide-ready perpetrators inside it. Millions. I'm sorry to say that. 
and many others who are not at the front, who are not committing these crimes directly, are ready to support them. They support them ideologically, they support them narratively, they support them by information war campaigns that they wage against the rest of the world, they support them by lying for them, they support them emotionally, right? This is a society, and I think this is similar to what happened, for instance, in Nazi Germany, where the brutalization, the, the, the readiness to commit these acts is actually widespread. And as you know, there is probably no, there is um, a famous, it's, it's contentious, it's not even that good, but there's a famous book about how the Holocaust happened in Germany called um, Hitler's Ordinary Executioners or something like that. Um, there's another book that's called Ordinary Man, and it's about... Precisely that. It's fairly ordinary German men. They're not particular SS. They're not elite units of the Totenkopf, whatever, right? They're just policemen. And they get drafted to the Eastern Front and they start massive mass killings of Jews, right? They're ordinary men. And I think we will see very similar approaches to the Israel of today in the future, which will basically be about ordinary Israelis not just about an elite of killers, elite in quotation marks, a small group of insane fascists at the top, Gavir, Smotrich, Netanyahu, Galant, all these types, right? But about the very, very disturbing, terrible fact that so many Israelis don't only go along with this, but participate in it. And then another thing, one last point to your initial question, how do you get people to do this? I think what's also very important is that to do this, I think the victims have to be perceived not only as helpless in the sense of, yes, they can fight, but they're much weaker than you objectively. So it's very difficult for them to, to pay you back to exact cost on you, right? No, they also have to be perceived as isolated, as if you want friendless. And that is where the famous figure of the bystander comes in, right? And one of these things that we've learned from the Holocaust is that there are no real bystanders, right? The real bystander is almost impossible. It's a philosophical construct. It's, it's sort of an ideal type that doesn't really occur in reality because most people, states, organizations, who become witnesses to something like that have some agency. They are not just neutral. They can do something or not do something. And this, of course, is the horrible guilt of the West. We signal back to Israeli society all the time that these Palestinians are friendless. We don't care. Go after them. There is no price to this. And this has two dimensions. One is, as it were, practical. It means impunity. And impunity is, of course, one of the things that has driven Israeli society so mad over time. But the other thing is that it also reinforces the psychological effect of, well, if nobody stands up for them, well, then clearly something is wrong with them. So they are not quite human. So we can as well exterminate them. And while we exterminate them, we can have sadistic fun with them, right? We are feeding back into this as well. Yeah, that's all. A, that's a really good point. And I, I'd like to sort of um, delve a bit further into the Holocaust comparison, because, you know, in the past, I tried to stay away from the Holocaust and Nazi comparisons. I think we're very much conditioned to you mentioned the role that Israel lobby plays in sort of having ownership over the idea of genocide and specifically like the Nazi Holocaust cannot be compared to anything else ever, ever, ever. Um, so there's that, and then there's also the fact that when it comes to the issue of, of Palestine, because of the sensitivity of equating, you know, the so-called Jewish state uh, with Nazis is, is very controversial. People shy away from it. But now the comparisons seem to make themselves, I mean, sometimes the Israelis themselves proudly make the comparison, which yeah. is always a bit jarring. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious if you could expand a bit on your thoughts on the usefulness of this comparison. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that you think this is a necessary comparison and you you have, you know, expertise in a particular part of the Holocaust. So can you explain why you think this comparison is is valid uh, and why you feel it's necessary at this point? Yes, um, I would put it like this. Um, the desire, the policy, the long term strategy of Israel and its interest and pressure groups outside Israel, right, 
um, to forbid us to make that comparison um, serves a direct function in shielding their own genocide. And, and also not only their genocide, uh, shielding all their crimes, the crime of apartheid, which is, of course, a recognized UN atrocity crime, right, as many people forget, the crime of ethnic cleansing. All of these crimes are shielded by this idea that you cannot possibly ever compare with the Holocaust. And why is this a shield? Because the idea, the implication here is that if something comparable to the Holocaust occurs, we all agree that we must act against it. So if we insist that you can never compare what we do to the Palestinians to the Holocaust, that is one way of ruling out the possibility that we ever come to the conclusion that we actually must act against it. This is what this really is about politically, right? And that's why I think it has to be resisted. But, but the deeper point is that when people shy away from that particular comparison, they do something that I think is incredibly racist in the end. Because what really what that implies is that they're very different victims in human history. And that if you are the victim of one genocide, you simply do not count as much as the victim of another genocide, right? That is an insane idea. Um, a child being starved systematically, painfully, slowly to death in Gaza now is not somehow lesser less than a child being starved in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942. That idea is insane. And this is the idea that is behind this absurd prohibition of comparison. And let me repeat once more, when we say we can compare, and I think we must compare, we are not saying we are equating, right? Because this is often mixed up. So the, the, the sort of defensive reflex you get against mentioning the Holocaust in the context of what Israelis do to Palestinians is that you're pretending it's the same. No, it's not the same, but there are features that are the same. There's suffering that is the same on the side of the victims. And there are types of behavior on the side of the perpetrator state, of the individual perpetrators, of the way that this is organized militarily, of the way that violence, brutal violence against helpless civilians is being normalized that are clearly the same. And this is just has to be acknowledged. That's the reality. Now, there's another point I'd like to make, which is, and, and I do the same. When we ask this question, how is this similar to the Holocaust? we almost automatically fall into this habit of thinking about the perpetrators. We think about how is it, for instance, that you can uh, mobilize all these Israeli reservists and they have been prepped with an ideological mindset that allows them to carry out, participate, enjoy these crimes, right? This is the focus on perpetrators. Um, how is it possible that the Israeli state achieves such an enormous isolation of the victims where almost nobody really wants to come to their help, like with very few exceptions, like Yemen? Um, let's not forget, World War II was not about helping the Jews. In the end, World War II also put a stop to the Holocaust, although six million millions had already, uh, million victims had already died, right? But the agenda of Germany's enemies in World War II was not to stop the Holocaust. That's simply not what happened. And in that sense, and before the war, when Jews were systematically persecuted in Germany and German-controlled areas already before 39, there's a history of abandoning them, not of helping them, not even of helping them getting out, right? This is actually what happened. And that, again, is very similar at an abstract level with what is done to the Palestinians now. They're being abandoned to their fate with a vengeance. But that brings me to this other point. We need to think from the perspective of the victims. We need to ask not only how is this similar from what happens on the perpetrator side, we need to ask how is this similar from what happens in terms of what happens in the experience of the people who are the victims of these horrible acts of violence, right? And there I would say, the similarities are striking. If you're a Palestinian now in Gaza, 
the whole world signals to you that not only you are on your own, but you don't count. You don't count. It's not important that you die. It's not important that they bomb your child. It's not important that they tore off the limbs of your child. It doesn't matter. What we will talk about is, well, are some Israelis somewhere afraid? Are some Jewish students afraid on an American campus? That's what we will talk about. We will not talk about you, the real victims of horrific violence, although we can see that violence very well. That sense of abandonment, I think, is incredibly similar. It has always struck me about the Holocaust, whenever I've read about it, that the horror is, in quotation marks, not only the murder. The murder is terrible. But how does it feel to be murdered often over an extensive period of time, to be starved, work to death, to live in fear, to try to escape but not manage? And all the time you know nobody will help you. Your former neighbors won't help you. Uh, other states won't help you. Nobody is there to help you. In fact, quite a lot of people will side with the perpetrators, although they have nothing to do with you. They will get a kick out of siding with them. For instance, Germans, quite a few Germans, who enjoy writing about what they call Pallywood. And you know what they mean by that. They mean that the Palestinians are faking their suffering. And there are a lot of Germans who have nothing to do with this except that they take a vicarious joy in putting the boot in as well. Right, they're slaughtering the Palestinians. Let's add an injury and an insult to that from the sidelines, right? So once you think about the experience of the victims, also the fact that your resistance is criminalized, that mm -hmm. um, when you actually, as much as you still can, pick up arms and fight back, you are treated as the Nazis treated these people as bandits. If you dared organize yourself in a partisan detachment, say in what is now Belarus, hide in the forest and start ambushing German convoys, they didn't say, oh, yeah, we can understand. We are after your skin. So, yeah, that's what's happening. No, you're bandits. Now you're extra bad. We will go after you. You're total criminals. And not only will we kill you when we get you, we will wipe out whole villages in the area because they've helped you. That's how bad this is. And we see something very similar. The, even the resistance to this obvious injustice is criminalized. All we talk about is classically, right? Do you condemn Hamas? Mm -hmm. This nonsense, which people are still not abandoning. Whereas a normal response would be, okay, there may also have been crimes Hamas committed, although probably, not probably, certainly far fewer than the Israelis have claimed, far fewer. But the bigger story about Hamas is that it is standing between genocide victims and genocide perpetrators. And when a resistance stands between genocide victims and genocide perpetrators, it would actually be our duty to support that resistance. And I mean this literally. If the West was more normal, we'd be giving arms to Hamas, and we should. We are living in a completely perverse world. And uh, when you when you said bandits, it actually made me think of the way that Ye the Yemenis are described, like as if they're just like pirates or something. Pirates. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. No, it's just, you know, that those are some really good examples. And, and something that came to mind as you were speaking about that, that I've kind of thought about before is, you know, one of the things that growing up in the West, you're often taught in history class during the World War II era is Anne Frank, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you read her diaries, like this is a young person in Austria, a Jewish girl who's like living in an attic, and then she's sent to a death camp, and like her family's being slaughtered. And there's these diary entries from her and she's just a normal kid and it like humanizes these people who, as you say, were at the time, you know, just completely abandoned. And then I think about what I see on social media and what I see on social media is a lot of Palestinian kids in Gaza, a lot of Palestinian teenagers in Gaza, a lot of people in their early 20s in Gaza who've actually, you know, gained quite a quite big followings because they are live streaming their genocide. I mean, yeah. it's more than just diary entries. Yes. They're live streaming their genocide. And because they're so dehumanized, people in the West, particularly those in positions of power, couldn't even fathom that yeah. these are just like hundreds of Anne Franks. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, there's even something more 
disturbing about the fact that it is in fact being live streamed. I mean, yes. the Holocaust was not live streamed. No. Um, you know, no. I don't buy that the people around it like didn't know what was happening. Yes. But generally no. speaking around the world, the horrors of the Holocaust were, uh, you know, revealed no. as, as years went by, right? This is happening in our faces. We're receiving it in our social media feeds. Mm. And something about that, 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 that aspect of it makes it, you know, almost like more horrific on a, on a sort of humanity level, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I, I actually principally agree. And, um, and again, I'm not relativizing the Holocaust. And, and obviously, none of us is saying that the victim numbers were the same or anything like this. But you are absolutely right. This is, in human history, this has never happened before. This didn't happen in Rwanda, for instance. It didn't happen during the Holocaust. This is the first live-streamed genocide. And that's what it is. It very much is that the technology had to reach a certain level. It had to happen in a certain part of the world that can't be completely cut off, although the Israelis, of course, would love to do that, right? And they're trying. But so the circumstances have, have stacked up in a way that this is, this has not happened before. This is the first genocide that humanity as a whole witnesses in real time, right? And so there is something that is worse because the question of how do the others respond is even more acute, right? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no way, there hasn't been a way for many months now that anybody could possibly say, oh, this is ambiguous. I don't really know what's going on. This is so complicated. We've now had a very clear picture delivered like all over the world of something that isn't complicated at all. This is mass slaughter and it's mass slaughter committed by national or ethnic criteria. This is classical genocide. And the purpose of the genocide is, I think this is very clear, ethnic cleansing. The genocide is carried out to remove these 2.3, 2.4 million Palestinians at the beginning of all of this. Now there are fewer because many have been murdered from the Gaza Strip, from the whole Gaza Strip, and then do something else with it. So this, I, there's absolutely no way one cannot see this. And we see it in real time. We have known it for a long time. And what is so striking is the immense resistance to acknowledge the fact that is right there in our face and to draw normal consequences from this, right? I mean, if you ask yourself, okay, the United States isn't ready to send an army to fight Israel. Right? If we lived in a normal world, the West should send armies to fight Israel, to defeat Israel. That would be a normal world. It's hard to imagine because ours is so far removed from that. If we were in a normal world, there would be an international coalition led by the West, led by the North, because they still have the biggest armies, and they would attack Israel and stop it. That would be a normal world, right? Acting according to the 1948 Genocide Convention and all sorts of other very important rules. But let's assume, okay, we, we can't even handle that. But we live in a much worse world than that. We live in a world in which, as we know, not only the USA, although the worst quantitatively, Germany, Canada, France, Britain, you name them, have proactively continued supporting the genocide. They are literally accomplices. They're not just tolerating it. That would be bad enough. That's horrible. They are accomplices. They are so deep inside this. I, I'm almost thinking accomplice isn't even the right word anymore. It's like a co-production. They're co-genociding. I would say the Germans are co-genociding with the Israelis. If you look at their arms exports, they have ramped them up during the genocide. The Americans, on a different scale, bigger of course, same picture. I truly don't know if accomplice even suffices anymore as a word. Yeah. You know, I, I really I, I want to raise a piece that you wrote that, that covers some of, of what you're talking about. And I think a really, really important right way at your Substack, which I encourage everybody to check out because you're always uh, writing really important pieces, not just on what's mm -hmm. happening in Gaza and Palestine, but also often on Ukraine. Um, but in this piece you wrote titled The Gaza Method, uh, 
uh, I'm just going to quote you. You write, it's an, it's obvious that the mass murder in Gaza outlines a pattern, a set of tools and measures of extermination, subjugation, and expulsion that are ready for export and will be in high demand, just like so much else of Israel spying, policing, uh, if that's the word, and murder skills and tech have always been. Uh, and I think it's really important you use this phrase, the Gaza method, and you note that you know that you're you're taking from um, Vincent mm-hmm. Bevins' yes. book, the Jakarta yes. method, which I've actually had Vincent Bevins on on yes. the show um, mm-hmm. to talk about that book. But explain what you mean when you say the Gaza method. Um, on one side, I, I think there are two dimensions to this, and that text was too short to to go into that. But, but I'm glad I can talk about it. On one side, there is what, what you know people like Anthony Lowenstein have have researched and, and written about, which is literally that not only Gaza, but all the Palestinians under Israeli control and under constant Israeli violence have been abused as a laboratory as a laboratory for tools of violence, repression, surveillance, you name it. And this has been going on for decades. He literally takes this back to the founding of Israel, right? So um, that is one side. Then the other side is that, of course, there is um, a reverse influx where all sorts of tools of violence also have come in from the supporters of Israel and help them commit their various atrocities against the the Palestinians. That is the the narrow context, and I think it's extremely important. But I think there's a broader context as well, and um, I'm not the only one who's who's talked about this. Um, I'm blanking right now, but there are several people who have made, even in politics, uh, of course in the global south, who have made similar points. And that is that if we for a moment um, take a step back and we abstract from the specific perpetrators and the specific victims, the Israelis and the Western backers on one side and the Palestinians on the other side, right? This is also, I think, a paradigmatic attack on a very poor, densely concentrated civil uh, population somewhere in the global south. And and when I saw how this was carried out, you know, and how they pretended that this was still war, a military campaign, and not a slaughter, a genocide, it immediately reminded me of something that I'd been aware of before, namely that since the 1990s, the U.S. military in particular has developed a whole body of doctrine, speculation, thinking about how to fight future wars in very dense urban um, settlements in the global south, essentially in places like Gaza. And, and this, this literature is rich. You can find it even on the internet. And often the idea is even that these places will be on coastlines, again, just like Gaza. And so I look at the way that the West behaves over this and at the way that we have this tacit agreement in the West to disregard literally decades of the development of human rights law, humanitarian law, the laws of war, all of this, we just disregard it. And we pretend that what is obviously falling under genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, all three of these, the whole package, is somehow still mostly normal warfare just with a lot of collateral damage. That's the position of the West, right? That's what they're doing. Yeah, it's a harsh campaign. Maybe we do it a little bit differently. But yeah, ultimately, war is war, right? Kirby has done that. Robert Habeck, the very influential and horrific minister of the economy in Germany, has made a very similar point months ago, saying that he literally said, you know, you can argue with Israel about whether they are not conducting this a little harshly, but it's not genocide, right? That was his point. So then you, it makes you think that this is what you want for the future. All of you, you want this toolbox. You want to be able to wage war like this and pretend it's still war. War is bad enough, but war is, under certain circumstances, legitimized in our cultures. It shouldn't be, but that's how it is. You get away with war, right? You wage a war as you as an army or you command a war as a commander or you order a war as a top politician and you'll be okay right unfortunately genocide is much harder if people really agree that you have committed genocide you may actually face punishment so here's the agenda the agenda is to get us habituated to this type of attack 
and and also saying, oh, this is war. This is still within the war box. It's terrible, but it's war. It's legitimate. So think about it. What do they want? They want to have the ability to destroy vital infrastructure throughout. Take out all the hospitals, for instance. Staff, absolute blockade. A blockade like this is a classical war crime. There's no doubt about it. And yet, we just like, okay, they do it, right? They want the ability to inflict collective punishment. Among other things, this is a classical case of collective punishment, which is a war crime. We've all agreed on this for a long time. So by normalizing this, by pretending that, oh, Israel is still within, like, it's tough, but it's in the parameters of war. By normalizing this, I have the horrific suspicion that they're preparing all of us, the whole world, for this type of warfare. This is the new type of warfare which they want in their toolbox. This is why I think this is a method which will not only be applied to Palestinians, but to others as well. And, and this is the ultimate irony, if people in the global north think that it will never be applied to them, I think they should be very, very careful because this is also a matter of class. This is a type of warfare to be applied against the poor in large gatherings. This is what this also is. It makes you wonder what they have planned for <laughs> the rest of the global south. And I mean, the way you, I, I love how you um, framed that in your piece as like, why is the West supporting all this? Despite like what you said, like it's just completely obliterating all of this humanitarian law that they spend yeah. their time setting up for all these decades to use it, you know, when it's advantageous to them and ignore yeah. when it's not. Um, but what's there to gain from genociding Gaza and potentially risking this bigger, bigger regional war? And then you put it, the word you use in the piece to really break down, like put everything you said to condense it into one word is it's precedent. It's yeah. a precedent for, and in a way, I mean, Gaza is like an extreme example of, of much of what we have seen in the yes. last 30 years in yes. terms of how the U.S. has behaved and their European yes. partners have behaved in Iraq, yes. in Syria, yes. in Libya, so how they've they been, you know, Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've been working up to it. You know, places like Mosul, for instance, you can, you can see this being foreshadowed, right? But this is even more extreme. And there's something else that occurred to me when I thought about this later, which is the perverse effect in the future might even be when the next place on somewhere on the global map is treated like this by attackers from the global West, and, and essentially Israel is a part of the global West, right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, we might be in a situation where we look back on Gaza and the story that we will be told on, for instance, CNN will be, hey, look, this isn't quite as bad as that. We left 50% of their hospitals standing. Right? Or we have only imposed a food blockade, we still let them have some water. Right? So they're setting this extremely high bar of violence and brutality and criminality. This is all criminal already by current laws. This is all criminal. And I can see a future in which we will be told, oh, yeah, but it's not quite as bad. Right? Stop worrying. Yeah, it's not as bad as Gaza. You know, it's yeah. interesting you put it that way. I had that, that's, that's really, really disturbing to think about because. Even as we're seeing this take place, you know, you'll often see people say, this makes Iraq basically look like nothing. Uh, yeah. Like They're already projecting Iraq, the, death, right? the death rate in Iraq was way yeah. less than this, even though in Iraq, yeah. I mean, it was obviously over years, but yeah. it's estimated that like a million yeah. people were killed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now we're at a point where, yeah, I mean, it's any, I mean, look at the Israelis are just slaughtering at such a fast pace. It's basically a death camp. Yeah. Anything less just won't be considered. Or think about the use of AI, right? I don't want to interrupt you, but we know, no, no. we've known this very early, 972, uh, 972 magazine. They published a long article about this, I think in November, very early. And they described this Israeli AI targeting system called the gospel. Uh, Habzora, I think. And what it is, you know, it, people are still discussing this monster and they're saying, oh, um, it's so weird, it's AI, but it doesn't make things more precise, you know, in the sense of, so they don't kill the civilians. It's never, it wasn't meant to do that. Never. It's an AI system that is clearly meant, what it does, and this is well known, and the Israelis admit that, it generates targets list, target gotcha. lists at a speed that no human group could match, like massively faster. 
So it pumps out targets for the Israelis to destroy. This is not about precision. This is about giving them points on the map to go after. And, you know, I, I put this somewhere like this, but I have to repeat it, not because I love the phrase so much, but I really feel that this is like the Terminator, but it's not even a computer. It's like the worst of the Terminator world, but it's run by sadistic humans, right? Yeah. And if you think about how, and we've recently had stories about testing of robots in Gaza, advanced war robots. And if it, it takes this together, they, 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 this is about the war of the future. There, there, there should be, they want fewer limits, far fewer limits than we are used to, or than we at least had on the books. Not that we always obey the limits, quite the opposite. But they want to be free of these old restraints, and they want to bring in new technologies to slaughter people at an unprecedented speed and make it even easier for the perpetrators to be safe, right? You kill from a plane, you kill with artillery, you kill by starvation, you use snipers from a distance, and then, even better, you send in the robots. All of this is already happening there. That's insane. So you've already sort of set up the theme for what I'm about to ask you. Uh, you know, Gaza does seem to have become a pretty explicit fight, at least legally and rhetorically, between global north versus global south. And of course, we talk about Israel. I absolutely agree with you. Um, Israel basically is just like an appendage of the, of the global north in in the Middle East. Uh, other another way to put this, I guess, could be you know <coughs> east and west on some level. But that said, I mean, would you agree with that framing that there is this kind of growing schism between the global north and the global south? I I, I you know I can imagine there's people in some countries across across the global south understanding exactly what you're saying. They're setting a precedent for what is okay to do to us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.